Good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. Good afternoon, everybody. Please continue eating. I know you haven't quite finished your meal yet, but uh, I'm just going to get go ahead and get started. We're starting a little bit earlier than you might get uh, be used to because we want to make sure to get everybody out of here in time for 2 o'clock so you can get back to your offices and back to your terminals and back to all the things you have to do. So we're going to try a little bit, a uh, little bit of an earlier start, but please do keep eating. Uh, please have, and have your coffee or whatever is coming next. But I'm going to go ahead and get started with some housekeeping announcements before our speaker comes up. And uh, first of all, thank you all for coming this afternoon to the FCC. Can I please remind everybody to please take out your cell phone and make sure you've got it on silent, as I will do right now. Uh, make sure make sure if those messages are or, or text messages or WhatsApp messages come in that they're not going to be disturbing uh, our, our conversation here with the speaker later on today. And uh, again, please do keep eating. Uh, we do have a couple of upcoming events I wanted to let you know about. We've got a really busy month of, of November, so I hope you all really keep track of your uh, of your FCCHK.org uh, website. Uh, we'll have some surprises coming up for you that I won't talk about later on in the month. But I will talk about what we have coming up tomorrow. Uh, tomorrow we have a club lunch. If you have not yet signed up for that, there's still, I think, a couple of places left. It's called Digital Standoff, the fight for tech supremacy between Silicon Valley and China. So, you know, those of you who are in that space know that Silicon Valley and China are now fighting for who's going to have supremacy in things like AI and other things. We've got a real all-star panel uh, signed up for that. Please go online as soon as you can and check on that one. And then we've got a special club dinner tomorrow night. Um, it's a conversation with the editor-in-chief of the Wall Street Journal, Matt Murray, who happens to be passing through Hong Kong. We've got Matt Murray here coming for an FCC club dinner. Um, it's a rare dinner we do. We don't do many of those. So I'm sure if any of you want to know what's going on uh, in journalism with the Wall Street Journal, one of, the, one of America's premier newspapers, or what's going on in Washington, D.C. with impeachment, or who's going to win the election next time around in the United States, you definitely don't want to miss that one. <laughs> so go, go ahead, sign up now. And uh, I just want to talk a little bit and then introduce uh, today's speaker, who's going to speak for about 20 minutes or so, then we'll take questions and answers afterwards. Um, I'll kind of moderate the Q&A session, but just, you know, beforehand, just rem if you're going to ask questions, make sure it's uh, a question with a question mark at the end of it. <laughs> uh, make sure you please introduce yourself because we're going to be live streaming it, and uh, it's always good to know who it is who's speaking because we can't have your picture there. So we'd like to know who it is asking the question, and just let us know your affiliation if you can. That's just for politeness to our speaker so we know who he's speaking with as well. Uh, and the topic is really one that I'm incredibly interested in. It's about uh, the fight for China's future, uh, civil society versus the Communist Party of China, um, which is uh, uh, a, a fascinating topic because we all talk about the trade war between the US and China, but in many ways, the battle for the future of China is going on internally, and civil society is a huge part of that. Civil society being this big word we speak of when we mean really this network of NGOs and volunteer organizations that many of us are familiar with, but are actually a relatively new phenomenon uh, when it comes to China. And our expert uh, here to talk today, our speaker, is really the person who can, can put this all into perspective for us. Uh, Willie Wolop Lam is one of these people who I can honestly say uh, I, I knew him before I met him. <laughs> because when I was a journalist in China, whenever there was something going on from 2009, 2010, with the growth of the internet and the growth of Weibo, and indeed the growth of civil society, Whenever I didn't know what was going on, and of course we didn't have that many sources we could talk to in Beijing or Shanghai, I'd end up calling Hong Kong and asking for Willie Lam. And not only is, uh, was he one of the uh, most generous people with his time on the telephone to foreign correspondents, but he also knew how to speak uh, uh, clearly and in what we in journalism call quotable form. <laughs> I mean, he, could give, he gives good quote. And uh, partly that's because he was a journalist before he was an academic. He's one of these great people who's managed to straddle both fields. Uh, he's now an adjunct professor at the Chinese University of Hong Kong at the Center for China Studies. Um, and before that, he was a longtime journalist with the South China Morning Post. He was the, uh, the Beijing correspondent, I believe, until 1989, uh, uh, Tiananmen Square protests. And he was the China editor after that until the 1997 handover. And since then, he's been in the academic field, but still uh, a, good, a good friend of journalists. You might see him quoted in many a story. 
And so without further ado, the club uh, and, and, and the board and everybody, we're really, really happy to have uh, Dr. Willie Wolop Lam here. Well, good afternoon, ladies and gentlemen. First of all, I must like to thank uh, Keith for a very generous introduction, and also I'd like to thank the FCC board for uh, this kind invitation. And um, before I begin, I must congratulate the uh, organizers for picking the right time to speak, because uh, when we had first discussed uh, such a session, nobody knew when the fourth plenary session of the Central Committee would have been held. So apparently somebody uh, on the board of the FCC uh, had a scoop that it would have been held in the last uh, few days of uh, October. So, uh, but we shall discuss the uh, implications of the fourth plenary session of the Central Committee uh, towards the end uh, during the Q&A period, plus also the uh, trade war between China and the U.S. Uh, apparently, the so-called uh, phase one um, uh, uh, negotiations and phase one accomplishments uh, are, are ready to be signed when uh, President Xi Jinping meets his counterpart, President uh, Donald Trump, someplace uh, in Iowa and or other parts of um, the U.S. So first of all, uh, back to the main theme of today. Um, well, I could sit here and uh, talk about Xi Jinping for two hours. Uh, if you have the patience, uh, and it's well worth it, because Xi Jinping, um, well, I, I better uh, let you have the first uh, state secret uh, I'm going to divulge for the day. Uh, Xi Jinping is younger, th younger than myself. Uh, I, I won't say by how many years, but Xi Jinping is de determined to rule until the 22nd Party Congress in 2032, which uh, when he will reach the ripe old age of uh, 79. Well, um, 79 doesn't seem to be that old an age if you look at the candidates currently running for the US presidency, but uh, more importantly, in China, uh, when somebody is in, in the late 70s, uh, he is supposed to have just barely crossed over the uh, threshold of middle age. Okay, so we anticipate many uh, happy returns to uh, Xi Jinping, uh, and uh, he will, according to my sources, rule at least until 2032. That means for 20 years. So Xi Jinping, after the 18th party, uh, 14th party, uh, after the uh, fourth plenum of the 19th Central Committee, I think he's as powerful as ever. So he is well placed to ensure that, first of all, the Communist Party will remain supreme, and that Xi Jinping himself, who has styled himself as the Mao Zedong of the, of the 21st century, that his power will not be challenged. Um, and to this end, he has put together a very viable police state apparatus, which a, um, an Oxford professor called the perfect dictatorship. Uh, the budget for maintaining stability for 2019 uh, according to my information, is estimated to be 1.39 trillion RMB, which is higher than the official PLA outlay of 1.19 trillion RMB uh, for the same year. So we see the determination with which, despite uh, Xi Jinping having uh, reached his status as the lifelong president, the lifelong call of the leadership, he's nervous about disturbances, nervous about challenges coming from disparate parts of uh, China, particularly the civil society. 
Okay. Uh, apart from the um, artificial intelligence assisted uh, police state apparatus, uh, Xi Jinping's uh, uh, security advisors have also been working very hard on what uh, our, our US friends called human intelligence. So they have recruited hundreds of thousands of so-called volunteer vigilantes all over the world. And in just one district in Chaoyang in Beijing, there are 130,000 volunteer vigilantes, which means there are 277 spies per square kilometers. Well, this is obviously a world record. So these spies would inform the police about uh, supposed plots to undermine the Communist Party. Uh, Xi Jinping is also a believer in the uh, a, a famous Chinese philosopher Han Fei, who uh, was the head of the legalist school during the uh, spring and autumn period. And he definitely uh, wants to apply Han Fei's philosophy of using stern laws and harsh punishment to ensure that the edicts of the emperor will be obeyed. Uh, this is despite Xi Jinping's insistence that the party plays a leading role uh, in writing the constitution and the laws and enforcing them. So the party runs the show basically, so far as the laws are concerned. And in the past several years, laws have been passed in areas relating to state secrets, counter espionage, and counter terrorism. So we see uh, within one of the uh, most popular groups within the civil society, the human rights lawyers, uh, they have been kept under 24 hour surveillance, but the important thing to remember is that even though they have lost the freedom, that means the human rights lawyers have lost the freedom in many cases to defend the underprivileged classes in society. Uh, they have maintained a nationwide organization. And here we see the wives of several uh, human rights uh, attorneys who have been arrested. The, rice, the wives have organized a very eye-catching and uh, very moving protests. Uh, throughout China. Well, the major theoretical framework, well, in, in China, uh, you cannot uh, avoid the discussion of theoretical framework because Xi Jinping uh, hopes that uh, in future, uh, the Chinese governance system will be improved and perfected. So. Uh, the ideal of a theoretical framework is paramount. And the most famous theoretical framework of Xi Jinping is the theory of the ideological battleground. So let me quote Xi Jinping briefly. This is the Maoist famous Chen Di Lun, theory of the battleground. So Xi Jinping said a few years ago, and I quote, if we do not occupy the Chen Di or the battleground, others will do it. If we do not fill the battleground with correct ideas, it will be infiltrated by unorthodox westernized precepts. So who are the people or organizations who might be in a position to fill the battleground with unorthodox westernized ideas? Well, these are the members of the civil society. And uh, um, I'm happy to report that in China there are about 700,000 registered social organizations, even though some of them are so-called gongos. That means government-organized uh, NGOs, government-organized NGOs, which are, of course, contradiction in terms. So there are about 700,000 such social civil organizations or, volunteer, or, or, or organizations of volunteers, and they, perform the useful function because they have ensured that the battleground is not only occupied by orthodox ideas, they have preserved their organization and their voice. And so I can say, I think without, without much exaggeration, that the battle for China's soul 
remains a toss-up, just because of the work of the civil society. Well, I'll give you here some quickly some examples of uh, uh, members of the establishment who disagree with uh, Xi Jinping and the uh, fact that they have been able to speak out suggests that the civil society is alive and well. So we have, uh, of course, to the left, uh, the liberal icon, the late General Secretary Hu Yaobang and his son Hu Deping, who have repeatedly criticized Xi Jinping for uh, reinstating Maoist norms. Uh, we have two famous uh, professors and intellectuals, of course, from a pivotal sector of the civil society. So let me uh, quote from a world-famous law professor from Tsinghua University, Professor Xu. He said, while reform has gone on for 40 years, we are back overnight to the ancient regime. In light of China's experience of using the open door policy to bring down domestic to bring about domestic reform, he urged China not to endanger ties with the Western world led by the U.S. We also have uh, the uh, to to the right uh, this lady, Mr. Uh, this lady, Ms. Ji Ji Zhongyun, who uh, in her younger days was a an interpreter, an English interpreter for Mao Zedong. So uh, she is now a, an international relations scholar, and Ji said that if China should open the door wider to things American, if Americans now hospitals flourish in China, China's blood-sucking medical model would be banished. And if American style education took part in, took root in China, China students need not go abroad to enjoy advanced pedagogical concepts. So these are intellectuals uh, going out on a limb to uh, have their say and of course, they want to uh, break open uh, the Maoist one voice chamber or um, monopoly of um, the universe of discourse, which Xi Jinping has brought back. Well, within the civil society, perhaps the largest sector consists of uh, religious people, Protestants, Catholics, Muslims, and others. And we are reminded that in 10 to 15 years, okay, in 10 to 15 years, these uh, Christians will outnumber the 90 million Communist Party members. At this stage, of course, they are kept under a very tight surveillance. And here uh, on the uh, top right hand corner, you can see the uh, CCTV camera. So, whatever the churches might be doing, they are recorded, they are, uh, their activities are being known to the authorities. But nonetheless, the good news is that the, these um, several uh, million Christians have been able to maintain a nationwide organization. And if the opportunity arises, they can. Uh, be very forthcoming regarding freedom of expression, freedom of uh, religion, and uh, they are willing to risk their personal freedom to uh, seek a world where uh, religion can be observed uh, freely. Okay, well here, uh, despite the uh, ubiquitous uh, presence of the police state apparatus, uh, I have pointed out chinks in the armor of the police state. First of all, uh, despite the fact that China is now the second largest economy in the world, uh, we have seen that Xi Jinping, uh, while uh, tabling the modernization of state governance at the fourth plenum, he has not been able to solve the problems of the underclass. In fact, disadvantaged classes are deemed one of the five new black categories of society that the party must guard against. The government's problem-solving skills remain highly in doubt. This is illustrated by the profusion of cases of social injustices. Well, 
take for example the mobilized soldiers. We all know that uh, Mao Zedong said uh, power grows out of the barrel of the gun. So one would have thought that the, the party would have taken very good care of the welfare of the mobilized soldiers. But no, the mobilized and unemployed soldiers, they have been um, neglected. And uh, year after year, we see demonstrations, sometimes in Beijing, just outside the uh, headquarters of the People's Liberation Army, of uh, tens of thousands of demobilized soldiers. And this has been, happen been happening year after year. The same goes for the victims of P2P uh, -P wealth creation products. Uh, these people have lost a lot of money uh, because they have bought uh, this Ponzi scheme like wealth creation products. But again, they are back on the streets for the past five, six years. It shows that the leadership doesn't have the wherewithal to solve this long-standing social problems. Uh, one other example, if such uh, another example is needed, is that fake dairy products and vaccines uh, have flooded the market to the extent that the parents of children who have consumed fake dairy, dairy products and vaccines, they have also organized themselves nationally. And despite the uh, close clampdown on the internet, uh, they have been thriving as uh, NGOs, fighting for the rights of the uh, ordinary Chinese to be served to be uh, to to enjoy healthy products, uh, whether it is medical or other fields. Okay, so this is uh, an illustration of the demobilized soldiers who have been undertaking uh, demonstrations year after year. More pictures of the demobilized soldiers. Okay. This is an illustration of the victims of this P2P Ponzi scheme like wealth products. Again, uh, the administration have not been able to think of a terminal solution. So they are back on the street, this time in the finance street in Beijing for the past five, six years. And these examples lead me to this important conclusion, and that is the civil society, despite the fact that uh, because of the police state apparatus, they are undergoing a long, tough winter, they are ways and means of fighting back. One method is what uh, former Peking University economist Sha Ye Lang said, fostering an organized state of disorganization. So according to Professor uh, Sha Ye Lang, it is difficult for intellectuals or NGO activities, NGO activists to organize anti-party activities. Yet, through the media and through different kinds of real-life interactions and appeals to people's conscience, a large group of civil society activists and politicized citizens aware of the importance of civil rights could be formed to clamor for action when opportunities arise. Well, I'll give you an example of the state of the underground churches. Well, officially, these uh, organizations uh, in the house, within the house church communities, they are broken up by the authorities, but through the internet and through word of mouth, through other uh, kinds of an, an organized state of this organization, they have been able to uh, splinter themselves in the groups of 40 or 50, and they have maintained vigorous and healthy uh, organizations in more than 10 provinces around China. Another example of how the society is, civil society is fighting back is what sinologists uh, from Toronto, U, U of Toronto, Diana Fu calls intervention via atomized actions. So instead of uh, making unnecessary sacrifices through direct confrontation with the police. Uh, Professor Fu has advocated 
the method called disguised collective action, which encourages civil society groups to exercise strategic adaptations through atomized actions or protest. Examples have been include the flash demos by five now famous families in Guangdong. Uh, they suddenly appeared uh, at the railway station uh, bearing placards and slogans uh, asking for better treatment for women. Uh, these atomized actions include the audience of a performance of Le Miserap in a Shanghai theater last year. So after the uh, performance of Le Miserap is over, they voluntarily stay behind and sing the song with which we are all so familiar. Do you hear the people sing? Okay, so this predated uh, a similar action by Hong Kong activists uh, what, one, two years later. And uh, another example of atomized um, civil society action is staging quickly organized labor strikes, such as the 2018 JASAC incident in Shenzhen. So this is a picture of uh, the uh, protests by the workers. Uh, this was organized within a few weeks and they were able to uh, invite concerned uh, students in Beidar and Tsinghua who belong to Marxist uh, organizations to come to Shenzhen uh, to give support. So uh, everything is done within a few weeks and uh, the authorities, even though they have arrested students and uh, workers, have not been able to stifle the seats of protest. Okay, the fact that despite overwhelming odds, the civil society, the NGOs have been able to stage actions against the authorities have come to mind the idea of a black swan. And you might be surprised that Xi Jinping himself, who seems super confident about the ability of the police state apparatus, it was Xi Jinping himself who early this year urged party cadres to raise their guard against black swan events, okay, black swan events, adding that the, the, the party and nation faced seven major risks, including politics, ideology, economics, technology, society, the external environment, and party construction. Well, uh, Xi Jinping actually was referring to the possibility of a color revolution, which uh, in the Chinese uh, cosmology means a um, collusion between anti-Beijing forces within China plus uh, hostile foreign forces such as those from the U.S. Well, uh, it turns out that we don't have witnessed any uh, black swan events in mainland China this year, but look at this, what's happening in Hong Kong, okay? Uh, the protests and demonstrations in the past uh, close to five months fits the bill of a uh, Black Swan event, uh, however you interpret it. And so far, the Black Swan event has tested the Xi Jinping regime to its limits. And we have again, uh, let me quote from the distinguished law professor from Tsinghua University, Professor Xu. So he has expressed thanks to Hong Kong's seven million people for sending the message of freedom to 1.4 billion people in the mainland. So this is the perhaps the best example of a civil society, even though uh, civil society based in Hong Kong, making a difference in national politics. So finally, may I conclude by citing the work of uh, world famous sinologist Ming Xin Pei. Professor Pei has identified the following four main symptoms of decay in Chinese society, okay? The atrophy of ideology, the erosion of 
performance, mainly in the economic sector, endemic of official corruption, and an intensifying power struggle and growing dissension amongst allies within the party over this survival strategy. And Professor Pei says that this new Cold War between the US and China could hasten the CCP's uh, collapse. The civil society could provide needed help. The civil society could provide needed help to the CCP faction that favors reform and change. Well, so far, uh, as we have uh, briefly alluded to the fourth plenary session of the Central Committee, we haven't seen actually any CCP faction that favors reform and change uh, to the extent to have attracted the backing of the civil society. But times are changing, okay? The economy of China is going through rough patches, and uh, it seems that Xi Jinping doesn't have the ways and means to tackle the challenges coming from Donald Trump, okay? Even though uh, the American election is coming up, and definitely uh, Xi Jinping, who is serving until 2032, will outlast uh, Donald Trump by many years. But this is one example where the civil society might make its strength felt by giving support to uh, factions and individuals and groups within the party that favors reform and change. Uh, I'll briefly end my discussion of the civil society here, but in the Q&A period, uh, I would be happy to answer questions about the what's the civil society in Hong Kong doing in influencing national events, and also, of course, the um, uh, perennial uh, trade disputes between China and the US since uh, March uh, in 2018. So thank you very much. Thank you. Thank you, Willie. And if, if you prefer to stay standing, that's, that's fantastic. And uh, okay. I will uh, start taking questions. I, I will reserve for myself as moderator the first question, if that's OK. But I will remind everybody, to please make sure your phones are off. And then when you ask your questions, just identify yourself by your name and your affiliation. But Willie, first question from me is, when you look at civil society, it's a big, broad term. But in China, are there some civil society groups or NGOs that the government is OK with? for example, in the environmental space, and are some like human rights lawyers that they crack down on, or is it all of civil society? That's yeah, um, a good question. Well, during the Hu Jintao period, I, I suppose most of us still remember Hu Jintao, right? <laughs> he is the uh, predecessor of Jiang Zemin, and the Hu Jintao era lasted from the year 2002 to 2012. Uh, Hu Jintao was actually a lot more tolerant about the civil society, and um, he has not tried out. He has not tried uh, uh, excessively uh, tough methods to clamp down on environmentally uh, oriented uh, NGOs. In fact, uh, he has farmed out. Um, some government projects, for example, uh, in terms of labor education, uh, collective bargaining education within factories and so forth, to uh, NGOs uh, in uh, Guangdong and some of the more uh, forward-looking provinces. And uh, I didn't have time to mention, uh, but the fact that uh, throughout the 2000s and uh, uh, the, the past 10 years, Many of the human rights lawyers, actually, they have won uh, national awards for helping the state mediate between uh, the disadvantaged classes and a court system which does not seem to be uh, ready to uh, take on the cases involving disadvantaged classes. So many of the human rights lawyers now under bar, uh, behind bars, have actually been awarded uh, by the Hu Jintao leadership. So I would say that in terms of the contention between the human, uh, civil society and the party state authorities are concerned, uh, we have seen a, a, a pronounced det deterioration since Xi Jinping took power in 2012. Thank you. 
And, and just to follow up with one thing, could you talk just for a second about foreign NGOs? Because I understand there's been a change of heart among foreign groups that have been operating in, in terms of registration, and, and some we know, some Europeans have been told to leave the country. Has there been a change of attitude towards foreign NGOs? Operating? Oh, definitely. Well, uh, you remember that I quoted uh, Xi Jinping as citing the possibility of a black swan event happening in China. So uh, Xi Jinping is warning, in fact, the possibility of a color revolution, which uh, the Chinese have defined as collusion between anti-Beijing forces within China plus hostile foreign forces, for example, the CIA or whatever. So uh, that is why in 2017, the party leadership passed a very draconian, a very tough uh, law against foreign NGOs, which uh, goes so far as uh, forcing these NGOs to have their uh, registra registration books, the um, activities profile, the agendas being inspected by uh, Chinese police on a um, weekly or even monthly basis. So uh, we expect the harsh treatment of foreign NGOs to be exacerbated in the coming few years. On that ominous note, I see one hand up here. Hi, I'm To Han Shi, a freelance journalist in Hong Kong. Um, two related questions. What's the current relationship between Jiang Zemin and Xi Jinping now? Are they in a power struggle or are they in good terms? And my second question is, there's this rumor going around Hong Kong that Jiang Zemin is a mastermind behind the Hong Kong protests. What do you say to that rumor? Right. Um, what is 100% sure is that um, there is no love lost between uh, Jiang Zemin and uh, Xi Jinping. Uh, in fact, uh, well, this might seem ironic because at the 17th Party Congress in 2007, it was Jiang Zemin, who nominated Xi Jinping uh, to become the, the next general secretary, to become the successor of Hu Jintao. However, uh, Jiang Zemin, even though he's an old fox, that was the biggest mistake he made throughout his career. That, that means nominating Xi Jinping as the successor of Hu Jintao, because the moment that uh, Xi Jinping has uh, ascended the so-called peacock throne uh, in uh, late 2012, he immediately turned against not just Jiang Zemin and Jiang Zemin's two children who are multi-billion, multi-millionaire uh, business people in Shanghai, but he turned against the entire Shanghai faction. As to whether, uh, as a revenge, uh, remnants of the Shanghai faction have been instrumental in stirring trouble, well, quote unquote, stirring trouble in Hong Kong. Uh, I don't believe this is true. Uh, the Shanghai faction is a spent force. And uh, despite the fact that uh, during the November, they are during the October 1st uh, army parade, uh, Jiang Zemin could muster an appearance at the rostrum of Tiananmen Square, I don't think the Shanghai faction is in a position to make trouble for Xi Jinping. Uh, indeed, there have been many reports that um, uh, if we look at the recent uh, several weeks of protests in Hong Kong, some of the worst cases of uh, uh, people throwing firebombs, uh, uh, the uh, protesters committing vandalism and so forth, there have been allegations that these were the handiwork of uh, paid agitators, uh, Ashan provocateur. Uh, these, these are members of the tri societies being paid by certain elements uh, to do such dirty jobs to ensure that uh, peace might not return to Hong Kong streets. Uh, there is no evidence that uh, the members of the Shanghai faction were indeed paying these um, uh, paid uh, agitators to, to prolong the cycle of violence in Hong Kong. Thank you. We have, I see a hand over here and then one over here. First. Um, I'm Fen Chuan from HSBC. I, 
I would like to ask uh, one question uh, regarding um, Beijing's policy towards Hong Kong. We just saw the news that uh, Xi Jinping shook hand with Mrs. Carrie Lam and, and fully acknowledging her work. So what would you expect to be uh, Beijing's policy towards Hong Kong after the fourth plenum and, and how would the strategy um, on the 2047 uh, be changed? Yeah, thank you very much. Well, um, to give you a one-word answer, uh, tough. Uh, Beijing will adopt uh, tougher, more draconian policies towards Hong Kong. Uh, if you read the uh, four, six, four, five, six thousand uh, communique of the fourth plenary session of the Central Committee, you have noticed that there was a reference to Hong Kong and that Hong Kong should improve and implement a system to uh, ensure national security, state security in Hong Kong. Well, there can be no more um, uh, no more obvious reference to Article 20, Article 23. And uh, the head of the uh, Legislative Affairs Commission uh, of the NPC, Mr. Shen Chun Yao, mentioned the fact that uh, the Chinese will also improve the system of the NPC Standing Committee interpreting the basic law. So most likely, the um, Article 23 will come not through the Hong Kong legislature, but it will appear just th simply through an NBC interpretation of the basic law. And this will exacerbate even, um, this will exacerbate the deep-seated uh, contradictions uh, in Hong Kong. But returning to uh, Carrie Lam herself, uh, well, she became a lame duck, I think, quite early on. And um, it's a question of Beijing trying to settle on a successor. As far as I know, uh, no successor has been named uh, so far. Uh, in the tradition of Chinese bureaucracy, until a certain official is sacked, uh, Beijing doesn't want to undermine her or his authority by not saying good words uh, for that uh, particular official. So until the announcement that Carrie Lam is stepping down uh, due to some uh, hitherto unknown illness or whatever, uh, Beijing would continue to uh, give her support. Uh, but the meeting with Han Zheng, who is the head of the Central um, Coordination Group on Hong Kong and Macau Affairs Office uh, on Wednesday, uh, could be more om ominous because it's been heavily rumored that they might discuss the identity of a successor to Carrie Lam. Well, uh, but... Uh, well, uh, shed no tears for Mrs. Lam because uh, her popularity rating in Hong Kong is abysmal. And I think the longer she hangs on to the job, the more difficult it is to promote uh, uh, the political reconciliation between the protesters on the one hand and the SAR administration and Beijing on the other. Thank you. Uh, hello, uh, my name is Robin Wong. I'm, I'm retired already. Um, actually, it's more of a follow-up of the previous question, is that uh, it seems to me, obviously, you're quite pessimistic about uh, Hong Kong. And uh, secondly, it seems that the more people protest, uh, the more they voice their grievances, the, the more uh, con tightened control China is going to impose on Hong Kong. I mean, in that respect, I mean, I'd like to hear your view about uh, how you see the longer-term future of Hong Kong and uh, whether the protests that have been made in the last so many months uh, uh, have any positive uh, consequences, perhaps. Anything you can think about positive about that? <laughs> oh, oh, thank you very much. Well, it, it's a good question, and um, I presume you are holding on to your... Um, I presume you're holding on to your um, extensive assets in Hong Kong. 
but let me say that, uh, well, that could be a silver lining. That could be a silver lining because uh, what's happening on the streets of Hong Kong cannot be solved by the so-called radical fringe uh, amongst the protesters on the one hand and, and the police. This is a political question which requires a political resolution. And I just mentioned a while ago that uh, uh, Carrie Lam and some of her top advisors uh, have become lame duck. So all initiative has to, has to come from Beijing. Uh, well, I have all along described Xi Jinping as a tough uh, conservative who, who likes to flash, flex his muscles, but uh, he's also a, a realistic uh, politician, particularly given the fact that um, the so-called red aristocracy, the, the princelings, the uh, senior officials and their friends, uh, they have uh, seen Hong Kong as a valuable place to park their money. Uh, well, I, I don't mean necessarily money laundering, but it's a useful place for them to make their investments and so forth. So for the sake of the interests of the right aristocracy, Xi Jinping uh, might see some incentive in trying to resolve deep-seated uh, political contradictions in Hong Kong, even though at this stage, uh, I, ha I haven't seen any evidence of this, but just the contrary. For example, the fact that Article 23 seems to have been put on the polit political agenda, uh, that, is a, that is a retrogression, and the fact that most likely uh, Article 23 will be promulgated just through an NBC standing committee interpretation of the basic law instead of going through the legislature as it was the case in 2003. But uh, Hong Kong is a resilient place, and uh, uh, there's a possibility that uh, the uh, enclave might yet emerge from the crisis uh, we have been witnessing uh, so uh, uh, desperately uh, in the past uh, five months. Thank you. I don't see any other hands, so I'm going to take the liberty to ask the last question, if I may, Professor. How secure in power is Xi Jinping? Well, as Mao Zedong said, um, power grows out of the barrel of a gun. Well, Xi Jinping has uh, tight control over the uh, control uh, apparatus of the military. Uh, there was a thoroughgoing reform of the uh, of the uh, senior PLA organizations in late 2015 and 2016, and uh, after the reor reorganization of the top party organs, Xi Jinping has placed members of his cronies, large numbers of his cronies, into top positions in the army. So he has solid control over the army and the police. So it is difficult for any ch challenges to uh, stage any kind of a, uh, well, not to say rebellion, but uh, viable challenge against Xi Jinping. However, uh, one has to distinguish between power and, and authority. Uh, Xi Jinping's power remains quite solid, but his authority has been dented because he has been seen as unable to solve three most outstanding problems in China. One is the economy. Uh, they will certainly uh, announce, and I, I can make a prediction, that uh, in the last few days of December, they will announce a GDP growth rate for this year of uh, around 6.1%, 6.2%. Right, even though uh, most of my uh, economist friends in Beijing um, uh, do not think uh, think that this is, this is a massaged figure, and the real GDP growth rate looks like uh, is just three uh, to four percent, if if that. So uh, he has been unable to turn the economy around. Uh, he has been unable to handle the. Uh, tough challenges of uh, President Donald Trump, 
and also to prevent the trade dispute from deteriorating into a full-fledged uh, Cold War. The third is inability to resolve the Hong Kong issue. Inability to solve the Hong Kong issue. So his Xi Jinping's authority as a capable leader, as a leader with resources, a leader strong in making policies instead of just a leader interested in building his own power base, has been dented, has been dented. But this doesn't affect his uh, staying power. I think there's really a good possibility that he could stay around as China's top leader for at least 10, 10 odd years. So uh, I think I will end uh, with this optimistic note. <laughs> Well, thank you, and before we give him a round of applause, I want you to know that the Christmas holiday season is coming up, and if you don't know what to get someone, an autographed book by someone <laughs> that you can sure get over there, I'm sure, is a really nice Christmas stocking gift. And before you go, Willie, thank you very much, and on behalf of the FCC, let me say thank you and give you a small gift. Thank you very much.